Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, introduce our, our program. I heard there was a debate tonight. <laughs> uh, it's nice that you came here to get real good information about the election from our two. And I'm sure they won't be having a debate, but they'll be having a good dialogue and a good conversation. Not that you can't vote for either one of them as a rising <laughs> candidate in the upcoming election. Uh, my pleasure to introduce a couple of, couple of my colleagues. Jesse Cummington is an assistant professor of, of political uh, science. He's the one that's closest to me. He's been at Westmont since 2007. He's a graduate of Pepperdine and Westminster Theological Seminary and is of uh, the University of Notre Dame, where he completed his doctorate. Uh, he teaches and writes in the fields of political theory and constitutional law. In fact, at, uh, at Westmont, he teaches a three-semester sequence in the history of political theory, covering classical, modern, and contemporary periods. He also teaches courses on Christian political thought and serves as the pre-law advisor for the institution. He's written and spoken often. He writes a lot on John Locke, as well as issues related to religion in the Supreme Court, um, and serves on the, the faculty council, which is the main leadership body uh, for the faculty at Westmont. Regardless of who wins election, he decided to leave the country next year. <laughs> he will be leading uh, Westmont's Europe semester. Uh, so, do you like what he has to say uh, tonight? Maybe there's, there's a spot in the Europe tour. Uh, anyway, uh, Jesse, pleasure to have you here. Telford Work is a professor of religious studies and chair of the religious studies department at Westmont. In addition to the expertise in, uh, in religious studies, he's also a graduate of Stanford and undergraduate degree in political science. So he brings some real qualifications to um, to this particular topic. Uh, probably his most distinguished degree, though, is that he's an Eagle Scout <laughs> and, uh, and an assistant scout master. So he brings quite a quite a variety of skills to our conversation. He's written uh, dozens of articles and, and several books, including. Ain't Too Proud to Beg, Living Through the Lord's Prayer, and Living and Active, Scripture in the Economy of Salvation, which was shortlisted for the Michael Ramsey Prize uh, in Theological Writing, which is uh, given by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he's the Associate Editor of Pro Ecclesia, and he keeps a very active website. If you Google Telford, you can find a wealth of information on his website. I'm pleased to have both these colleagues here and look forward to our interaction with them this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Shortlisted means one uh, uh, came in second, which during election season is fine, right? Um, So uh, I've studiously avoided wearing any red or blue tonight. <laughs> and um, let me let me give us let me give us uh, a rundown of the the topics and who will be addressing them. We're going to alternate. Uh, I'll begin by explaining the the rules that the Constitution lays down for how um, how we work in a in a religiously plural republic. And then looking through the, the, the subcultures, the religious subcultures that the candidates come from, which those rules have encouraged. Uh, then Jesse will talk about the American electorate's response to those religious subcultures and, and, uh, and their salience and non-salience in this election. Um, then I'll come back and talk about how the, the candidates' religion or theology relate to some policy issues. Jesse will uh, bet, uh, clean up by, by talking about religious polarization of uh, the parties and the, uh, the electoral support of different religious groups. And then we'll have questions and answers. So that's, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, so a black liberationist, a Mormon, and two Catholics walk into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Only the Mormon maybe doesn't walk into the bar. But, um, I, I think it's 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 really kind of astounding when you look at the the religious makeup of these two tickets. This is the first time in American history that a ticket 
uh, that we have a ticket that's in, on which is no Protestant. Romney Ryan is a non-Protestant ticket. And that's the first time that's happened. Did you notice? I mean, some of you are nodding, but some of you are shaking your heads. I think that's, that in itself is, is pretty remarkable. I, I hadn't thought about it until I ran across it when I was just doing some, uh, some of the preparation for this. Um, so let's talk about the rules by which uh, our different religious groups operate in American politics and, and uh, public life. Because I think they'll help uh, describe some of the dynamics going on. And uh, Jesse and I, from the beginning of, of talking through this, have noticed that in, in a number of ways, religion is a non-story in this election. I mean, it's not a, it's not a non-factor, <coughs> but it's, it's surprisingly quiet in a surprising number of ways, number of places. Mum's the word on whether we talk about the, the, the faith of our two presidential candidates. And um, I'm not sure whether mum's the word because it's irrelevant, because religious, uh, religious factors are not materially that significant to informing their, their, their policy making, their visions, et cetera. Or is mum the, is, is, uh, the word because religion is the elephant in the room, because it's too potentially explosive a topic? Maybe there's elements of both. Um, if that's the case, I think what, what's happening is we're trying to play by the rules of American democracy. And the rules in American democracy uh, in a religiously plural society are, are laid down by the Constitution. Um, which arises not because it was a, a purely theoretical construct. It arises because America was largely founded by, founded by dissenters, right? who were trying to um, ensure there would be space for their own particular, well, their own religious particularity in a republic. And the rules are, I'm gonna try to paraphrase to keep it not too technically uh, uh, political scientist, scientific. The rules are be yourselves, get along, and you work it out. I think that's the First Amendment in common <laughs> language. All right, be yourselves, free expression. Get along, though. There are ways of uh, there are ways of of being yourself that are inappropriate in our society, and don't expect a state church. Don't expect us to step in and uh, and make big decisions between your squabbles. Uh, and that arrangement has been surprisingly robust. In fact. Uh, I had made some of these observations four years ago when we were talking about religion in the 2008 election, and I, I, finding those notes and looking them over, I, I was again pretty impressed that that um, the Constitution and, and, and American society takes in stride people from religious minorities that would have thought uh, to be deeply problematic decades ago. And they're, they're so problematic, or so really unproblematic, that we're basically at a 50-50 election again. With the, you know, depending on the poll, with, with it tipping one way or another, one way or another. Again, I, I just think that's astounding, that the constitutional arrangement is such that um, two, two people, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, from uh, minority traditions, the black church, and, and specifically the sort of liberationist tinged side of the black church on the one hand, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on the other hand, are both extremely and fully competitive for the presidency. Wow. Um, this arrangement, these rules, rely on uh, some some dualism between what you can do in public and what you can do in private. A, a dichotomy between public and private with uh, some subtle coercion for those who, who uh, cross boundaries. 
with rough edges where there's not full agreement on what ought to be public and what ought to be private and how that expression ought to work. Um, and some impracticalities, some, some, uh, some tensions that don't seem to be resolvable. And, and so that arrangement uh, is operating in such a way that those rough edges and impracticalities are always surfacing, especially with regard to religious minorities. If you look at, for instance, constitutional law, Jehovah's Witnesses come up again and again because their way of being themselves uh, bumps up again and again against you work it out. So these, keep, these things keep uh, surfacing, especially with religious minorities. Um, increasing American religious diversity, both within Christian circles and, and outside Christian circles, increasing diversity puts strains on that arrangement because there, there can be less and less in common. And greater state power, you know, the, the, the more the government does, in a way, the less there is for, for these groups to work out among themselves without interference. Uh, so, the, so the things that are putting strains, I think, on the constitutional arrangement are growing religious diversity and greater and, uh, and more, um, more involved state power. On the other hand, factors that ease those strains are weaker convictions on the part of majorities as well as minorities, uh, and weaker identities and affiliations, uh, an American talent for holding these affiliations loosely or partially or compartmentalizing them or in some other way negotiating this arrangement. All right. So, uh, you can, you can come up with political justifications for this arrangement or critiques. You can come up with theological justifications or critiques. You can look at the, the, the history that brought it into being uh, and has moved it along as constitutional law um, twists and turns. You can look at all those factors, but I think that arrangement will adapt and it'll survive as long as it remains workable. And so far it has. Uh, and that begs the question, which maybe we'll talk about, maybe Jesse will raise, what factors might make it unworkable? Or at least what factors make it less workable? Um, now, that arrangement, be yourselves. What was the second one again? Get along. I should quiz you. Get along. Thank you. I should have turned that into a quiz and you would have known that. <laughs> Uh, be yourself, get along, you work it out. That is profoundly shaping of the religious subcultures of the country. Right? It's, it lays down the rules by which we operate and by which we come to understand ourselves. So, uh, and that, that shapes the imagination of the candidates and the voters and the constituencies in ways that sometimes we don't even notice because they're the ground rules. Sometimes you don't even notice the ground rules until maybe you step into a society that has a different arrangement. Maybe a Constantinian church in, an, in another country or maybe uh, a place where Christians are in a tiny minority and there's a different set of rules. So in the interest of time, we can't go through all those religious subcultures because there are simply too many. But we can look at the ones that shape the perspectives of our candidates. That's what, that's what I want to do just to, to review and some of this is going to re be review, I, I hope. Starting with Barack Obama who uh, I think it's safe to say comes out of the progressive wing of the American black church in terms of his, his formal affiliation and a lot of his sensitivities. He was raised a skeptic uh, by, a, by an ex-Muslim and atheistic father and a non-practicing Baptist slash Methodist mother's family. Um, but he, he entered uh, into a progressive Christian church in the UCC, United Church of Christ, congregational, uh, with a lot of influence from the liberationist side of, uh, of the black church. From the part of the black church that entered the, the new left establishment out, uh, after the civil rights era. 
there are, there's a lot of diversity within the black church. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of um, conservatism and radicalism and, and um, really fascinating combinations of both in ways that aren't terribly intuitive to, to white Christians or to Hispanics or Asians because of the, the, the particular history of the black church in America. Um, what else can we say about Barack Obama's um, faith and subculture? Since 2009, um, Washington Post did an article where they, they just put, put out a series of his most visible professions of Christian faith at National Prayer Breakfast, et cetera. In part to clear the air because of the, the persistent um, claims in some quarters that he's not a Christian. So in those statements, he comes across with uh, pretty straightforward affirmations of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, Lord and Savior. Obama says he was drawn to the Christian faith from that upbringing because, quote, month after month, because of month after month working with church folks who simply wanted to help neighbors who were down on their luck. It was working alongside Christians, helping other people that drew him to considering and embracing the Christian faith. Uh, you can call that a, a kind of social gospel vision of Christianity. And different people use these terms in, in pejorative ways or in supportive ways. I don't mean, I don't mean to, to, I don't mean any pejorative connotations with liberationist uh, or social gospel Christianity. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a label that often people within the tradition use themselves. Um, so a social gospel vision draws him to Christianity and animates the connection that he talks about and sees between God and his own public life, his own role as president. Uh, in, a, in an interview in 2004 with Sojourners Magazine, this is before he was considering running, this is before his, uh, his convention speech that put him on the, on the fast track, he stressed that uh, he's a Christian. Although he said he draws as much from Judaism and Islam uh, sometimes as, as Christian principles, uh, having grown up in Hawaii, He's absorbed Eastern influences. These are all his own words. And um, as well as secularism through university and, and family circles. So uh, a pretty synthetic, you know, a pretty synthetic imagination. Um, he talks a lot, as we'll see later on, about if there's a, the if there's a theological ethic that he wants to embrace, it's, it's I'm my brother's keeper. Right, uh, you are your brother's keeper. And in that interview he says he can put that in, in entirely adequate secular terms. That doesn't need to be put in Christian terms. On the other hand, he stresses that he's a constitutionalist who's firmly committed to separation of church and state. Um, Biden, I mean I hope some of this is reviewed because they've been, he's been president for four years, so. Um, just consider it a reminder. Biden gets more detail maybe because of some helpful contrast that this will bring up with Ryan. He's Irish Catholic, so was Ryan. Went through Catholic parochial school, so did Ryan. Went through Catholic prep school, unlike Ryan. Married a Protestant. Um, comes from urban mid 20th century immigrant Catholicism. which Americanized and which uh, interculturalized. You know, it, it, it didn't stay exclusively Irish or exclusively Italian or exclusively German, but it internationalized according to the rules, the, the constitutional rules in, in a religiously plural republic as they operate at the time. Um, and absorbed what Catholicism was absorbing in the middle of the middle to late 20th century, which was Vatican II as Americans received it. You know, Vatican II was a, a real um, can't say break, because it isn't. Uh, it, was, it was a real revisitation of Catholic tradition in light of the modern world and modern culture, which opened a lot of doors in, in new ways. And so I think it's helpful to think of Biden as, as 
growing up and, and um, living a, a life of a Vatican II, post-Vatican II Catholic. His faith was rocked by losing his wife and daughter in a car crash. And his faith wasn't terribly helpful at the time, at least he says that. Came back to a life of active faith in 1988 after surviving an aneurysm and after having the last rites pronounced over him by his priest. And um, brought that, that seems to have revived an active Christian participation. Uh, one at rosary under his pillow, carried it, carries it, attends mass regularly. He met John Paul II four times. He's met Benedict XVI once um, last year. So on the one hand, a, a pretty active Catholic life at the moment. On the other hand, um, gets in trouble with some Catholic authorities over Catholic social teachings and his refusal to, um, to endorse them in a public way. I mean, in a, in a public policy way. Uh, and says his church is bigger, you know, the church is bigger than that. The church is bigger than that full obedience. Now, uh, that's a, it's a pretty Western Catholic vision, particularly an American Catholic vision, right? There's a strong tradition in America of taking, uh, taking some aspects of Catholic social teaching and leaving others uh, in an eclectic way. That describes him. Uh, he reversed course, as you probably remember, on gay marriage. And, uh, and, and really precipitated Obama's needing to address that in public and, and evolving on the topic. Uh, Biden is personally pro-life, he says, but publicly pro-choice and pro-public funding for abortion, which leads to friction with his bishop and, and others. All right? So that's Biden's religious subculture, mid-20th century ethnic, urban, post-Vatican II. What about the Republican ticket? Well, Romney's lifelong LDS, Latter-day Saint, son of uh, his father's generation's most prominent Mormon in public life. The first Mormon Romney uh, began following Joseph Smith in 1837. So Romney's Mormon pedigree goes back to the beginning. Uh, in fact, the first, I, I didn't write down his first name, but um, but the Romney who first followed Joseph Smith trekked out to Utah with the originals. So this is, this, is a, this is a family that's been right in the middle of the tradition since the very beginning. Took a mission in France, which is uh, widely done among men and increasingly women. Um, lots, of church, lots of church involvement, both as a child and now as uh, as an adult. I would say that of the four, his, his uh, personal practices, his business practices, his vision, et cetera, seems most, uh, most thoroughly informed by his faith, the least eclectic of the four. Um, a fellow churchgoer in an interview said, being, being LDS is at the center of who he really is embodies Mormon social teachings, uh, works hard to apply them intensively in the church and apply them to the wider world, which is, again, a Mormon habit. An example of, um, well, one example of, of Mormon convictions applied to the wider world is Boy Scouts. Half of American Boy Scouts are Mormon. It's their youth program for, for boys. And um, another one, uh, another example of this cultural trait is uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is repackaged Mormon ethics. So that, that kind of thing is a distinctively Mormon trait, a distinctively Mormon way of engaging the culture. He attends services regularly, wherever he is at the time. Uh, this religious subculture, um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, because I think it's actually the most relevant force to, to informing his particular style, but um, but if you wanted to describe the, the theology that animates the daily give and take of Mormon life, it's this. Salvation depends on self-improvement uh, and godliness. 
to inherit the, the greater cosmic responsibilities that are that are ahead for Latter Day Saints. All right. Um, grace and forgiveness, absolutely. But the stress goes on. If you like, it goes on sanctification. It goes on personal moral development to get ready for the future. Um, strict but empathetic, I think. Again, absorbing that from the from the Mormon subculture. Active in praying and fasting. I, I was I was amused to read about this in a New York Times article that seemed a little incredulous that there were reports that he prays about matters at work, at home. He goes home and he prays about work. You see, the reporter was like, "Wow." <laughs> okay. Um, the Mormon, uh, the Mormon subculture produces a particular vision of America. I'm going to get some of that. I'm going to get into some of that later on because I think it's a little better addressed in my third in my third section about public policy. And then Ryan, like I said, Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade, regularly attended mass and continues to attend mass. Uh, his observance wasn't shaken by the crisis of losing his father at 16. Although he did uh, become a, a big fan and reader of Ayn Rand. Um, that's his eclectic side, I guess. <laughs> Attends a congressional Bible study group regularly. Uh, if Biden is a product of the, the Vatican II and post-Vatican II era of rethinking how Catholicism needs to look in the modern world, Ryan is a product of the John Paul II and Benedict XVI era of trying to um, hold on to Catholic tradition as a Vatican II, post-Vatican II tradition. Not really backtracking, but backtracking, but, but trying to keep clear on what it means to be Catholic. Uh, he's unabashedly supportive of Catholic social teachings. Opposes the health and human services mandate on birth control and abortion which you can do on either First Amendment or theological grounds. And in, in his case, they seem to, to coincide. Um, his budget got some pushback and criticism from Catholic leaders, especially Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit, rather liberationist um, strand of, of Catholic moral teachings. And uh, appealed in response to a Catholic principle called subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is a category that says if a, if, a, if a local group, whether it's church, you know, parish, city, state, can handle a matter, it, doesn't need, it shouldn't get bumped all the way up to, to the global, you know, federal level. It's kind of theological federalism. Um, Here's a remark on, on the different demeanors of the two Catholic visions here. Biden is said by, uh, to come across to Catholic voters as, as uh, exercising a kind of soft power and, and being <coughs> compassionate and, and amiable, whereas Ryan is said to come off as, as hard rather than soft and doctrinaire. Uh, whether that means he's less empathetic, well, I guess it depends on whether the doctrines that are being insisted on are life-giving or not. Right. Nevertheless, those are two pretty distinct Catholic, now American ideological subcultures. So, um, so here's a characterization from uh, someone at Catholic University of America. Biden is of the old <laughs> urban style Catholic social identity of the 50s. All right, urban style Catholic 1950s social identity. While Ryan is from the professional class Catholicism that made it out to the suburbs and is now um, living a, a suburban professional Catholic life. I can only, I can only drop this and, and uh, if you want to talk about it later in Q&A, we can. Those strike me as two different flavors of Augustinianism. Both of those both of those visions of, of uh, Catholic faithfulness look like different sides of Augustine's vision of sin and grace and virtue and, and 
and life in a fallen world. Um, but they're, very, they're pretty distinct and, and different Augustinian approaches. I think Augustine was the last consistent Augustinian. <laughs> Everybody since then has tried and failed. So that's a, a glimpse at the subcultures, and particularly the subcultures as they related to these, these four candidates. Over to okay. you. All right. Well, um, it's, a, it, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to lose these while I, uh, while I talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get to have some of this conversation, even though I'm shorter than, than Telford is. Um, the, he's got our candidates walking into a bar. I, I would say my main segue from that is um, um, Jimmy Buffett is playing over the jukebox in that bar. Um, there's a quote, um, a joke that you may have heard that's been attributed to Jimmy Buffett, which is, um, uh, you know, are you ignorant or just apathetic? To which we all know the answer, right? It's I, I don't know and I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and, and I would say I would say the I don't know if it's really Jimmy Buffett who said that or not. But the but 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 I, the the story that I want to tell in talking about how the electorate has responded to the religious identity of these candidates is largely the I don't know and I don't care story. And so um, I'm going to move kind of fast through a lot of numbers, um, kind of a lot of political science. Um, I would say, don't worry about holding on to all the pieces. Um, instead, see how they contribute to telling that story of, um, of the ways in which, I would say, the electorate has responded to, I'm going to talk mainly about the presidential candidates, not the vice presidential ones, um, with Actually, given the relevance of candidates' religious identity in recent electoral politics, I mean, think back to the primaries in 2000. The big, the big story in the Republican primary, one of the big stories, was George W. Bush in a debate when asked who his favorite philosopher was, saying Jesus Christ. That was that that that, that stayed a story for a long time. Um, uh, similarly, you could think about um, uh, uh, you know. Senator Obama's, or then Senator Obama's 2006 speech, um, uh, called, his called a renewal speech, in which he tells his own story of faith, and then also just the centrality of his having to distance himself from his pastor, Jeremiah Wright, in order to maintain his credibility in the 2008 presidential election. I'd say, the story that we've heard lately is religious identity matters a lot to electoral politics. And I'd say that's not the story we're hearing this time, which I think makes it an interesting, it's an interesting question to pursue. So I want to suggest that, um, that this is odd, that it's worth pursuing. Um, and so then I want to ask, if you pursue it, what are the key indicators of this lack of salience? of religious, uh, the religious identity of the candidates. What are the key indicators and their limitations? And, um, and what might explain them? So a lot of what I'm going to be drawing on is, um, is uh, uh, public opinion data from, uh, particularly from the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. There's also some Gallup, um, uh, Gallup material in here, uh, maybe going a little bit beyond that as well. But so first, I want to start with the question of ignorance. And I just want to say the public is remarkably ignorant of the candidates' religious identities, uh, given the exposure period that we've had with both of them. Uh, as of this summer, 40% of Americans did not know that Governor Romney is a member of the LDS Church. Now, this is up slightly from the 50% who didn't know it as of last November, but only a 10% bump after all the exposure of the primary season? See, that's fairly surprising. Um, similarly, and this is even more surprising, only 49% of Americans correctly identify Barack Obama as a Christian. 49%. What's even more surprising? That's lower than the 55% who could do it four years ago. Now that, that, that actually speaks of something more than, uh, more than ignorance, it actually speaks of, of misinformation, but it, it, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, um, so if we've got, I would say, 60% and 49% suggest awareness of candidates' religious identity is 
pretty low. Um, secondly, so we've got low, low awareness. Um, second, I'd like to suggest that the public is not particularly concerned about the candidate's religious identity. You know, for President Obama, some 19% of, um, of those uh, uh, being polled expressed concern about his religion. Um, concern about Governor Romney's religion is also minimal. Only 13% of those surveyed see his religion as a, a, a reason for concern. Um, but what's interesting here is that getting accurate information actually has a different effect on how people per perceive these candidates. So, um, so people who know, have accurate information about President Obama's um, uh, identity as, um, as a, a Protestant events less concern, but people who, um, I, actually the data is a little bit mixed on Romney, but there, but there are some signs that those who actually know that Romney is a Mormon are more likely to have concern about his religion. So actually getting accurate information has a, has a different effect on how voters perceive um, each of the two of them. Um, but those are still low numbers um, for, who's, who, for, for those who are kind of treating this as electorally significant and who they're going to, uh, to vote for. Um, though to candidate religion is not a major concern. Um, moreover, they don't seem to care, even though only 14% of Americans recently say, said that they, they feel like they know a lot about Mormonism, um, only about 15% actually want to learn anything more um, um, about Governor Romney's religion. Well, that, I think we're back to Buffett. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know and I don't care to know more. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to sum up, I would say yeah, it, it persists in being not particularly salient in ways that are a significant break with uh, the, the role that religion has held in very recent electoral politics. So why? Why? I, I, I'm going to take a couple of stabs here, um, but I would say these are more um, um, speculative um, and, um, and probably not the whole story. Number one, anybody remember um, James Carville, the Raging Cajun? James Carville, now he's on TV, so everybody knows him. But, the, but, but James Carville's uh, uh, refrain, one of his key refrains for the Clinton campaign in 92 was, uh, the economy, stupid. Um, that what do we need to keep repeating? The economy, the economy, the economy. And I would say um, one of the reasons that religion isn't particularly salient in this election is the economy, stupid. Um, that economic concerns remain central. If you look at what are the you know, top 10 um, concerns that voters have um, on particular issues, um, six out of the, uh, you know, four out of the top six are all specifically related to the economy. I mean, so that, I would say that is absolutely central. Second reason I think it's not particularly salient is there's a, there's a degree to which it, you might argue it's yesterday's news. That is, we aired a lot of this stuff out in 2008 you know, Romney gave his um, Faith in America speech, aptly titled Faith in America speech in, um, uh, in Texas, and kind of said kind of what drives me and what I perceive our nation to be is really all about the Constitution. Um, 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 so I'm not going to, you know, do anything that should concern you too much. Um, similarly, President Obama in 2008 had to distance himself from Jeremiah Wright, those kinds of things. So you might say, well, this is yesterday's news. We've already, we've already, uh, we've already dealt with these things. So maybe that's part of it. I think two, two other things that, that might be worth mentioning here are, are one is that there's declining, uh, declining public interest in the culture wars. Culture wars aren't gone, but I would say there's a little bit more reticence from the public about the culture wars. And religious identity is so closely correlated with the culture wars divide between traditionalists and modernists. Um, uh, that invoking religion looks like a return, you know, going back to the 1980s and 90s um, kind of culture war battles over social issues. And so people may be a little gun shy of, of talking about religion because they don't want to go there. Um, and polls continue to show uh, Americans are very wary of church involvement in politics. The, the one other thing that I'll mention as to why this may be is that I think that the candidates have a fairly high incentive to not talk about religion. I don't think religion helps either one of these candidates in anything beyond the most generic expressions. Um, uh, that is, uh, you know, unlike someone like George W. Bush, I mean, the, the, the studies on, on, on Bush's candidacy and presidency was that he was able to speak the language of evangelicals in a way that, that uh, created a sense from evangelicals, he's one of us. And that, and, and that was very powerful for him electorally. And I would say neither of these candidates has that sort of an opportunity. Um, uh, so uh, 
for Obama, his African-American church identity, as we've been hearing about from Telford, is fairly unique and distinctive, and it's going to be less familiar to many Americans. And if he really goes into the details on, on that or sp starts speaking the language of that, it, will not, it, won't, it won't help him. It'll probably hurt him. Likewise for Romney, Latter-day Saints. That's only 2% um, uh, of the population. That's pretty small. It's going to be foreign. If he focuses on the details, it's going to alien, alienate, not help. Um, so I think that they have a pretty strong incentive not to do this. Now, what, what this means, I think what some of the, what some of the data suggests then, is that um, absent a more prominent culture war agenda in this election, um, religious concerns about the candidates seem, when they are expressed, do seem more symbolic than substantive. And what I mean by that is, um, is that when religion is a concern to people, it's a concern um, about identity, not issue positions, if that makes sense. That is, we don't have any tight correlation in terms of public debate about the candidate's religions and, um, and specific issues. This makes me think it's a little bit more like what, what we're seeing now, you know, particularly with Romney, would be those who are concerned about Romney's Mormonism are behaving in a way that's more similar to how the public saw Al Smith in 1924. My memories of that are kind of fuzzy, but but um, <laughs> how um, thanks, <laughs> uh, how the um, how the um, public saw Al Smith in 1924, um, how his Catholicism was critiqued, it was tinged with nationalism, it was there was a lot of propaganda, it was not issue based. In contrast how Kennedy's Catholicism was treated in 1960 was very different, really focused in on can a, well, I wouldn't have said this at the time, but can a pre-Vatican II Catholic endorse the Constitution? Now, that's actually specific. It's not a symbolic problem with the religious persuasion. It's actually a substantive one. Similarly, what does it mean to have a president who's accountable to a foreign prelate? These, these were the kinds of questions which I would say they had more traction than symbolic, um, the, the, than being symbolic appeals. And I think, um, even for, um, uh, you know, in this election, even for those who do find, say, Mormonism uncomfortable or unfamiliar, um, they don't have specific policy-driven objections. Um, and they aren't airing those concerns in public, particularly because um, doing so would appear intolerant, and most Americans know that kind of intolerance um, uh, just doesn't go um, uh, in, in, in line with the constitutional structure that Telford has explained. Um, Romney did try some of this in the primaries. He said things like, you know, the, the, you know, the president was trying to make America a less Christian nation, um, um, this sort of thing. But I think he is, he's rightly aware that that won't work in a general election and has backed off um, quite explicitly. Um, I think the other, the, the other elephant in the room item, of, you know, tell said maybe there's an elephant in the room. I think the other elephant in the room that sometimes gets mentioned in, the, in, in public discussion is the very tight correlation between each of the, t the two presidential candidates' religions and race. Mormonism, very white, it has a pretty um, inauspicious history with regard to racial uh, issues. Um, similarly, you know, the, 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 the liberationist part of the, uh, of the black church, it's not very diverse. And so, so anytime you start bringing up race, it threat, I mean, bringing up religion, it threatens to, um, uh, to draw race into the discussion as well. So in, in some, and then I'll hand things back to Telford. Um, I think Kennett's religion has taken a back seat um, in, in both voter information and voter concern, but I think the symbolic role, even if it's not being talked about, may still have a minor impact, um, even if that impact is suppressed somewhat in public debate and in poll results. Um, now, Telford's going to share some of the ways in which the candidate's theological commitments do intersect with specific um, issue and uh, public policy questions. Um, I think this is interesting both because um, it'll, it's relevant to the issues that we've seen come up in public debate and the ones that we haven't, which I think in some ways are more, uh, more interesting. But uh, um, I'll be back a little bit more briefly after that, but Telford, it's all you. So that's a that's a really helpful distinction between symbolic and and what was the other um, substantive substantive great um, uh, relevance how how do these how do these theological visions um, actually inform I'm going to back up I'm going to, I'm going to widen it from just public policy to include just uh, well style of governments as, governance as well because I think in Romney's case both those things apply. Um, so, 
to, uh, to address Obama's? Well, we should know by now, and, and I've already mentioned it. Um, the most consistent theme that, that, that strikes a Christian note in what, he, in what he does is, I am my brother's keeper, right? Uh, we have an obligation to one another. And that is, um, that is theologically developed when he brings Christian theology to bear. Um, and I think it marks, well, just, just in, the, in the debate between him and Romney a couple of weeks ago, I noticed that uh, again and again he returns to this. What about people who need help? And that's a my brother's keeper paradigm. But it's also one that looks consistently to government action. Government is how I'm my brother's keeper. Not exclusively, of course, but again and again, since he's in government, government comes up as, as uh, a necessary way to be my brother's keeper. Um, I think that is a place where the theological vision of the social gospel uh, intensifies that commitment and directs it and can shape it as well, although I'm not sure exactly how precisely it shapes it. Um, and now see, here's where I think I want to add one. It's not, this, is not, this is not one of the house rules of the, of the First Amendment, but it's, a house, it's one of the rules of, of electoral politics. Alongside, be yourselves, etc., is do your chores. Uh, you can contribute to the wider, to the general welfare, if you like. You can contribute to the health of the republic um, by doing your chores. And, and Christianity here is doing the chores by, by fueling a commitment to one another through government action that's meant to help people who need that help. That would be one place. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, Romney does his chores in a different way. It's a different, it's, it's a different uh, way of fulfilling that expectation. Uh, another place where, I'm not sure how to develop this, but I think a, a place where his, his um, religious vision as described in, in some of those interviews is relevant is in foreign policy. And this is gonna stand in some contrast to Romney. Uh, Romney embodies American exceptionalism because Mormonism embodies American exceptionalism. Um, what about Obama? What about, what about that UCC um, liberationist strand of Christianity? Is he a Martin Luther King style American exceptionalist where it's incumbent on us to be the kind of just society that shows the world what justice ought to look like. There, there's a kind of American exceptionalism there, a civil rights exceptionalism. Um, or on the other hand, uh, is, is that church tradition embodying a kind of class of 1968 anti-exceptionalism where, and I, I, I encountered this in college in the poli-sci department, where America is treated as embodying the worst in the world, embodying colonialism, imperialism, you know, power and abuse of power and all the rest, injustice. That's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of inverted American exceptionalism. Or is Obama drawing on, uh, on the same tradition to, to, to cast a kind of European style unexceptionalism? Where America, come on, we gotta, we gotta come off our pedestal. We're a country. The country, you know, the world is full of them, and we need to take our place and stop pretending that we're, you know, a shining city on a hill. I think all three of those strands are possible ways of developing um, uh, of his theology informing his foreign policy. And maybe this is for Q and A. I'm not sure where. I'm not sure where where he lands. Maybe. Maybe in um, different places on different issues, actually. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, certain, I'm just not sure at all. Uh, the flip on gay marriage this year indicates that it can be hard to, to use religion to develop a, a prediction of where Obama's stances will be. Or actually, that's it's easier to do in Biden's case. 
because of the, the way that public-private works out. I don't think the black church tradition has that same, uh, has that same way of negotiating the public-private distinction. So it's a little hard to say. But I think when, 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 when our subcultures are called to do our chores for the greater good of the whole society, that's how Obama approaches it. Romney, how does, it, how does Romney and, and his subculture help him do his chores? Well, um, uh, Latter-day Saint culture is, is, embodies a kind of Norman Rockwell-like patriotism. If, if you even look at, at the iconography, if you look at the way that both church leaders are presented and Jesus is presented and uh, the founding fathers of the republic are presented, it's in a kind of similar, it's in a kind of similar um, graphic style. And that looks, that looks striking if you're not used to it. On the other hand, it is pretty striking to go to Washington, D.C. and look up at the rotunda of the Capitol building and see George Washington seated on a, on a throne on Mount Olympus, which I believe it, isn't that, isn't that where he is? Um, there is a kind of civic exaltation of the republic, the constitution, the founding fathers, which, which was just common. I, mean, I think it's the way that Americans did it. You know, James Madison would say of the Constitution, write these on your, on, your, um, on your gates and meditate on them. Talk about them when you're on the road and when you're, and he's talking about Deuteronomy, but he's referring to the Constitution. Our, our dollar bills have the great seal of the United States and under it, it says Novus Ordo Seclorum, New Order of the Ages. Um, they, had a pretty, they had a pretty strong sense of American exceptionalism back in the 19th century and the 18th century. And I, I don't know whether, well, I don't think LDS culture generates it so much as it kept it. As, as increasing numbers of Americans dropped it. Nevertheless, I think, I think that imagination fuels the idea that America is providentially, uh, is a providential gift from God to the world. It's embodied in LDS theology, which treats the Americas as the place where the Latter-day Saints, you know, where, where Jesus came after, after uh, being in the Middle East, and Jesus will come back in the, in the US territory in, in Missouri, according to Mormon eschatology. So, um, so does that fuel a kind of vision of America's role in the world? Well. You hope it does, right? I mean, if he's that active in church, he must be paying attention. <laughs> so there's going to be a there's going to be a very robust care for uh, for American democracy, American exceptionalism, American restoration, where where the United States seems not to be as as uh, bright as it had been. Um, America is the promised land, according to Mormon theology. And, and along with that goes some, some cultural traits that I think obviously inform his, his imagination for policies. Uh, LDS culture is suspicious of big government, in part because of some bad experiences of big government in the 19th century, uh, of the federal government. Um, they, they remember the persecutions that drove them from New York to Illinois, to Missouri, to Utah. That's, a, that's an epic. It's a deeply formative for Mormon imagination. Uh, Mormons are suspicious of debt. Uh, chronic indebtedness is a kind of uh, moral irresponsibility and moral failure. Self-reliant, a culture of extreme self-reliance along with generosity to those in need. But it's private generosity rather than federalized generosity. They're their brother's keepers as well, but in, but in a different way, in a different style. And uh, the stories of Mitt Romney's past attest exactly to that. There was a lot of outcry about uh, how he hadn't released his tax returns, and then he did release his tax returns, and, and he turns out to have tied, what, like 30% of his income, um, $4 million 
in a year, which he didn't even count all of towards a tax deduction, like he voluntarily declared less than he had given. Um, you haven't heard too much about tax returns since then, because that didn't, that wasn't, that didn't have the traction that it was supposed to have. Um, a culture of industry. Utah's flag's motto says industry. There's a beehive on it, because bees are hard workers. So uh, the Mormon work ethic and the Mormon ethic of responsibility and the Mormon worldview are absolutely going to inform a, um, an effort to remove whatever disincentives there are towards industry. And you heard, I think, uh, if you heard the debate, uh, the public sector was not mentioned as the place that needs to step in to help people. Uh, Romney's answers again and again on the economy were about the government getting out of the way of people who were trying to make ends meet. I, I think rhetorically those were two different visions. They weren't just playing to different constituencies. I think they come out of two different I think they come out of two different um, visions for how we do our chores, how, how a particular culture contributes to the, the general welfare. All right, so I think in a way Romney's uh, religion and theology informs public policy as more in his executive style, more in the style of governance, the emphasis on ethics and, and so on. That's, that's pretty pronounced in Mormonism. <coughs> Um, all four candidates, though, can operate in ways that are dissonant with their own faith. Romney could, uh, Romney could um, okay, attack ads that broke his earlier pledges not to represent in a certain way. And, and the way Obama uh, has treated his half-brother doesn't suggest complete you know, harmony with being your brother's keeper. And, uh, all four of them, you know, a Catholic who reads Ayn Rand and um, a Catholic who just shrugs off social teachings, um, all of them are somewhat inconsistent. So, so I think it's unfair to even expect a, a, a smooth pipeline from theology or religion or worldview to policy or, or to actions. There's inconsistency in all, in all four and the rest of us, right? Um, that's an interesting list, I think, but it's a rather short list. And the, fact, uh, the reason it's a short list, I think, is maybe because they'll, they'll all be playing by the Constitution's rules. Like, either ticket will more or less take its distinct place in the same arrangement that all these other tickets have over the years and play by more or less the same rules, not compartmentalizing their faith but taking primarily civic cues rather than theological or even subcultural cues. They are stepping into a role that's been well-defined, and they'll be more or less behaving themselves. All right. And the parties are changing, particularly with regard to the religious polarization of the parties. We hear a lot about polarization in Washington these days. Um, I'm not referring to the type of Certainly, the type of polarization that we hear about in the news. I want to talk specifically about um, about religious polarization in the parties. Um, if we had more time, well, we'll see. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about the distribution of candidate support among different religious groups because I think that's a very interesting thing that going on as well. But but briefly, I would say that the. Parties and religious polarization has been a very interesting story this year. I mean, a number of you uh, 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 may have watched the conventions, uh, particularly the, uh, the Democratic Convention was interesting in this respect. The DNC platform that went to the convention um, uh, at the beginning of September did not mention God and didn't make any mention of Jerusalem. The platform that left that convention did. And it was amended at the, con uh, at the convention to a, a highly controversial vote because it required a two-thirds majority. And even after three, three tries on voice vote, um, Villaraigosa couldn't, couldn't get a clear, I, I mean, it really, it was very controversial because it was not clearly even a majority voting in favor of the changes. The fact that it was that controversial, I think, says something about the party. And they weren't really that, that interesting of changes. I, don't think I, you know, one was talking about um, God reaching people's God-given potential. Um, but that doesn't seem like a, a 
a major statement about God um, um, necessarily um, compared to some of the other possibilities. In contrast, the Republican, the Republican um, uh, platform statement this year mentions God no less than 10 times. It talks about God-given rights, God-given talents, God-given resources, all these things, and um, includes uh, an entire section on religious freedom. So I'd say the contrast there between the parties with regard to explicitly religious issues is striking. Likewise, uh, public opinion reflects, I would say, some increasing polarization as to which uh, party is religion friendly. Um, in 2008, Democrats uh, made some very intentional religious overtures, um, uh, making um, religious constituencies a key um, uh, target of outreach with some success. Um, um, but this year, even, even those gains had slid some. So, um, um, you know, 35% of the population see the Democratic Party as religion friendly, 20% more, 50, or nearly 20% more, 54% see the Republican Party as religion friendly. I'd say public opinion is tracking with some religious polarization of the parties. And one of the big stories this week, if you've been reading the news, is the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life released some, some new data, actually a pretty substantial study, that shows patterns of religious disaffiliation radically increasing. And radical is a strong word, so may, maybe I should back off that a little bit. But it's radical, I think in this sense, prior to the 1990s, uh, those who, who, who we would consider non-affiliates with a religious group. By non-affiliates, we're talking about atheists, agnostics, and those who say nothing in particular. Um, um, kind of all lumped together. It doesn't mean they're not spiritual in some sense, it just means they don't affiliate with any religious groups. Prior to the 1990s, for four decades, you have stability of about 10%, actually a little bit less, um, falling into that category. Then, uh, by, uh, by what, 2007, it jumped up to 15%. In the last five years, it's jumped to 20%, well, 19.6. So one in five Americans um, does not affiliate with a religious group. That's an interesting story. And it's particularly interesting given the unique um, electoral behavior um, of that particular subset. Um, well, I could talk a little bit about why there's that drop off, but maybe we'll save that for q and if we want to come back to it. Um, it may be that this change is not going to be electorally significant in this election. I think there's a good argument that it won't be electorally significant. That is, the people who are now not identifying with a religious group are those who um, were already not going to church or to any place of worship. So it's the non-attenders that are now just saying, I'm not going to call myself this because I have no involvement with it anyway. So it may not be all that important. But, and here's, and here's, here's the... Here's the hook, is I think it does say something uh, about the polarization of the parties because of where the non-affiliates are going um, or, where, or where they sort out. I think the change is going to sharpen the religious polarization of the parties. We're talking about a group of 46 million Americans. That's actually a, 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 a significant number. 63% of non-religious affiliates identify with the Democratic Party. In 2008, 75% of them voted Democrat. I would say that that's an interesting story. I think that as more non-attenders identify as non-affiliates, the Democratic Party is likely to increasingly appear to be the party of non-affiliates, and the Republican Party is going to increasingly be seen as the party of, um, of the religious. Now, there's a lot more nuance we could add to that, um, um, but, uh, but uh, I won't. Maybe. Before we go to Q&A, let me just say this. There's some, inter there's some interesting uh, post-first debate data out on how different members of different religious groups, different religious affiliates, um, responded to the debate. I mean, because the big story we all know. The big story is the president goes into the debate with a, with, with a pretty solid lead. Um, you know, Governor Romney, fairly far back. The debate happens. They're about tied um, um, uh, with registered voters at 46%. Um, with likely voters, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit offset in favor of, um, of, of Romney. Uh, what's interesting is when you break it down by religious affiliation, and this is not, what I'm saying is not a, any, I'm not trying to make any causal claims, I'm just making a correlation claim. Um, the, the, the correlation is interesting because none of those gains, none of the gains for Romney are from um, white evangelicals, um, in fact, after the debate, white evangelicals 
Democrats were slightly more likely to support the President Obama, which is interesting. Wait, 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 it, it, the other, the other I- piece of this is that the biggest, the biggest shifts came with white mainline Protestants um, that, uh, that before the debate were basically tied in their support for the two candidates. After the debate, there is a, um, a 26 point uh, percentage point gap between them in support of Romney. That's a huge change. The other interesting, th- oh okay, I'll be really brief. Two other interesting things. One, that um, that non-affiliates went down in their support of both candidates. <laughs> um, uh, there was no sort of corresponding thing. Those who don't affiliate, um, sounds like they are less excited about this election. They're e- well, e- they're either undecided or they're not going to turn out to vote. Um, um, okay, you know what? I'll resist. I'll leave it there. Um, I wouldn't. I would be reticent to draw any firm conclusions about these observations prior to subsequent debates, prior to further analysis, those kinds of things. But it is intriguing to see the striking differences in um, in the voting plans of these different groups in light of that debate, in light of this kind of the story that we're hearing about the, the 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 game change that the debate was. In closing, I want to point back to to Telford's observation regarding the durability of the constitutional system to accommodate a range of candidates and voters' religious persuasions. You know, we've got a Mormon, two very different Catholics, and a Protestant with a liberationist uh, church background. Race. And religion is not a primary issue. That's it. This is encouraging. That's, that's a good thing. Um, at the same time, I would say, in light of the potentially destabilizing effects of religious polarization in the parties, we might want to give some sustained attention to how we can best maintain that constitutional order that Telford was talking about. How do we maintain a durable, free, and tolerant political context, um, even in the light of uh, of what I think are some real challenges, um, um, including uh, some of the polarization and the implications that it has. But with that, we'll stop and uh, and we'll go to, uh, to questions, so.